Our scripture passage for this morning comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Listen now for God's word. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man who much evil has been done to saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. And just like that, Paul, rather Saul, a murderer of Christians becomes a follower of Christ. I think sometimes the significance and the drastic nature of Saul's conversion is lost on us because we're so familiar with the story. It's just, well, of course that happens. That's Paul, a great leader of the church. Let me put it in terms that we might um, understand a little better. Are there any diehard Cowboys fans here this morning? Just one? Okay, that's surprising, but I thank you. (laughs) So what would happen if a diehard Cowboys fan all of a sudden became a fan of the Washington Redskins or the New York Giants or, dare I say, the the Philadelphia Eagles, right? That just kind of creates this stinging sensation for those of you who are Cowboys fans. I happen to like the Chargers. We'll talk about that later. But this is the drastic nature of Paul's conversion. From one direction in life, he met the risen Christ and did a complete 180 degree reorientation. Have you ever known someone like that? Someone whose life was stuck going one direction and they met the risen Christ and they completely turned everything around? If you've been in the church for any period of time, you've probably heard stories of people who were, who were drug addicts or they were, they were stuck in this life of sin and they met Jesus and instantaneously everything changed for them. They left their former life behind and they began their new life right there in that moment. These stories are inspiring to us 
We sing about these stories. Last week here at First Methodist Richardson, we finished the service by singing, My chains are gone, I've been set free. We're inspired because we say, well, if God can change that person in an instant, then just think about what God can do in my life. And yet, what happens when our story isn't as exciting as Paul's? What happens when our story looks nothing like this 180 degree turn from a former life to a new life in Christ? What happens when our chains aren't really being released as quickly as we would like them to be? Well, my name is Josh Fitzpatrick, and I'm a new associate pastor here at First Methodist Richardson. And when Clayton asked me to preach on this particular Sunday, he said, you're going to be in the middle of a sermon series, and I want you to take the opportunity to tell a little bit of your own story. And so I said, okay, sure, I'd love to. And so I was almost literally born and raised in the church. Get this. I was born on a Sunday around 9 a.m., and my mom brought me to the 6 p.m. service that same day. My sister was receiving an award, and I always joke that by the time you're the fourth child, which I am, your parents don't care quite as much about you. You know how it goes. The first child is always huddled over, and the parents have the the hand sanitizer that they're just ready to squirt, or whatever hand is coming out. We've been there. We're on number three, and I think we're going to stick with number three. But by the time you get to number four, you just don't care as much, and so you take your child wherever, whenever, and my parents decided to take me to church the day I was born. And as I grew up in that church for the next 18 years of my life, I was surrounded by a community of believers who raised me in the faith, who surrounded me with the love of God, and who poured into me with this Christ-like wisdom. As I got into high school and into college, there was something that began to bother me, and that was that I couldn't point to the exact day and time that I had become a Christian. This bothered me because I had friends who did. They knew exactly when they maybe walked down that aisle and gave their life to Christ, or they they had this Paul experience of completely changing everything around in one instance, and yet I was secretly afraid that someone was going to ask me, well, when did you become a Christian? And I wouldn't be able to answer them because I, I didn't know. And that bothered me until I got to seminary. And in seminary, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I got my Master of Divinity there, and I took a class on evangelism. And the professor wrote a book called Conversion in the New Testament. And in this class, he presented the difference between the conversion experience of Paul, which he called punctiliar. It was this this one-point-in-time transition from a former life to a new life in Christ compared that experience to the experience of Jesus' disciples, which was slow and gradual and took place over the course of time. He used the Gospel of Mark in particular to paint this picture for us and show us that the language used throughout the Gospel of Mark as the disciples are referring to Jesus progresses and changes over the course of the Gospel. So as they began to follow Jesus, they used the term rabbi most often. And then they began to call Jesus the Messiah and the the Son of God and the Son of Man, these increasingly significant terms as they slowly began to realize just what type of rabbi this Jesus guy really is. And for the first time in my life, I had language to describe my experience. I wasn't like Paul with this single point, punctiliar point in time. I wanted to be more punctiliar. I was not punctiliar. I was slow and gradual like the disciples, getting to know Jesus over the course of a lifetime, blessed by being surrounded by God's love, walking step by step after Christ. Some people have stories like Paul, and that's awesome. But some people have stories like Jesus' disciples, and that's okay, too. John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church. 
he was big on this notion of assurance of faith, which is simply the idea that the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart to assure us of our salvation. And I knew that I had that within me. I knew in my heart of hearts that I knew Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I couldn't point to the point that that change had been made from my former life to my new life, or what we might say from, from unbelief to belief. So when I took that class in seminary, I finally had language to describe my experience. I think far too often as Christians, we make this process of becoming a Christian too scientific and, and formulaic, and it's just not how it works. And so we say, well, all you need to do is say this little prayer, and that might be part of your experience, but it's so much more rich than that. I like to compare the process of becoming a Christian to the process of, of falling in love. So as much as I'd like to tell you that the moment that I saw Megan, I was head over heels in love with her and I knew that I was gonna spend the rest of my life with her in that moment, that would be inaccurate. It would be more accurate to say the moment I saw her, I was extremely attracted to her and the thought of long-term potential entered my mind but attraction isn't love. Funny side story, my roommate in college was my best friend and he was the one who introduced me to Megan in the first place. And after we got done chatting, the three of us, my roommate and I walked away and he turned to me and he said, man, she is so far out of our league. <laughs> I was like, stick with your own league, buddy. <laughs> but as Megan and I began to date, and we spent more and more time together, I began to fall in love with her. I still remember the day that I knew I was in love with Megan, but it was in retrospect. I knew that I loved her, I knew that I needed to tell her, but I could not point to the time that that transition had been made from one feeling to the next. It wasn't like, okay, I almost love her, I almost love her, I almost love her, boom, I love her. Clayton warned me about that first step. I almost just <laughs> did a face dive off the stage here. It was slow and gradual and took place over the length of time as we walked together and got to know one another better. Some of us have experiences like Paul. If we were to extend that metaphor, that would be like falling head over heels in love, love at first sight. But some of us have experiences like Jesus' disciples, where we date the person, we get to know the person, and over the course of time, we gradually fall in love. Hear me clearly this morning. What I'm not saying is that it's difficult to become a Christian. We say that we are saved by grace through faith. That is, this gift of God's grace to us is a completely free gift that is open and available to all. All we need to do is believe. And yet, we all come to this point of belief in different ways. For example, my dad. My dad wasn't a Christian when he met my mom. He wasn't raised in a Christian family. He was raised in a good family, they just, never really saw the need for God in their life. And so when my dad began dating my mom, who was a devout Christian, raised in a, a very strong Christian household, he recognized that this might become a problem. Particularly when my mom told him that she would not marry him unless he became a Christian. Now, for my dad, like for many people, Christianity had to make sense intellectually in order for him to commit his life to Christ. And so he began to ask the tough questions and, and wrestle with what faith was and different aspects of theology. And then my mom introduced my dad to a pastor named Reuben Welch, who told him, at some point, Mike, you're just going to have to take a leap of faith. At some point, you're going to have to recognize that you might not have all the answers to all of life's questions. So one day, after my dad got done spending time talking to the God that he didn't know he believed in or not, he was walking down the street, and he came to the intersection 
of Euclid Avenue, the renowned mathematician, intellectual, and Easter Way. And as he looked up and he saw those two street signs pointing in opposite directions, that was his moment of confirmation that he had to make a decision to reorient his life away from the street and story he had been on and to start walking on Easter way, the way of Christ. Now, that didn't mean that he had to just completely neglect the intellectual aspects of the faith, but what it did mean is that he needed to take that leap of faith first and then slowly over time connect with Christ more emotionally and intellectually as he fell deeper and deeper in love with his creator. And so we have what I call my storyless story. We have my dad's story. And then I want to close briefly this morning by telling you my grandfather's story. Remember, my dad wasn't raised in a Christian household. And so when my dad became a Christian, he wanted more than anything for his entire family to know the same loving grace of Jesus that had changed his life. And so for years, he would pray for his dad. And for years, he would casually bring up God in conversations. And for years, he would even directly talk to his dad about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet for years, it would fall on deaf ears. So as my grandfather got older, my dad got more and more worried that he was going to pass away without ever knowing the love of Jesus Christ in that intimate, personal relationship way. And yet he also got less hopeful that that gospel message was going to be spoken through him. And then get this. One day, my grandfather calls my dad and says, Mike, you'll never guess what just happened. This guy just knocked on my door, wanted to tell me about Jesus, and so I invited him in, and he did, and for the first time, it all made sense, and I finally believe. <laughs> and my dad was shocked and thrilled and confused and joyous all mixed together. After years and years, of praying and trying to share his own story with his father, some random or not so random evangelist knocks on my grandfather's door and it all clicks. Three different generations. Three very different stories. And yet I'm confident that the three of us will be celebrating in the presence of our Creator in heaven. We all find God in different ways. Each one of us has a unique story. And that's the beauty of it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.